well, this is kind of a long story and I'll try to make it really short. Um, a friend of mine went to a birthday party and I, I don't really enjoy parties because I'm not going to go too far into this, but I have a very severe case of face blindness. And I tend to uh, really uh, be awkward in social situations because I don't know who anyone is because they all look exactly alike to me. So I usually avoid parties. And uh, so um, I uh, went to her party though because she, she wanted me to show up for a party and, and I didn't want to be a no-show. And mm. I, thought, well, I thought, well, I'll make an appearance, you know show up, say happy birthday, maybe drink one beer and take off. You know? mm. And uh, so I showed up at a party and she was already a little lit and there were a bunch of people there. And, uh, and, and she said, oh, Kathy, you've got to read this book. And I was like, oh, that's the one thing that you can count on me. I'm the, I am the friend who will read anything you get me to read. <laughs> I'll, like to read. <laughs> I'll read the laundry box all day long, you know? So, so, so she sent me this book and I'll I send you, send you a copy of my book. You should, I'll read it. All right. Uh, and, uh, and anyway, the book was called uh, You're a Badass at Making Money. And uh, I thought it was very interesting because I've never made any money. And uh, a lot of people have been very frustrated with this. Like, you should be making money. I don't understand. You're beautiful. You're talented. You're a great songwriter. You're hard mm. workers show up. You know, uh, you invest your own money in it. I, I don't know why you're not making any money. And I'm like, I don't know either. I'm doing everything right as far as I know. <laughs> and, uh, and so this book uh, had this uh, thing in it. It said, uh, probably if you're, if you're doing everything right and you're not making any money, um, you may have beliefs about money that are uh, holding you back. And uh, mm. what did your parents teach you about money? And uh, you might have mentioned that thing I, meant, I said about being a saint, right? My, my, mother, my mother was very genuinely spiritual, uh, mm. not a religious uh, evangelical or anything like that, but just very, very spiritual person. And, uh, and she was a major influence in my life because my father was absent. So the very first thing that came to my mind when, uh, when I was asking, the book was asking me the question, what did your parents teach you about money? I was this, you can have spiritual health or you can have money, but you can't have both. And if you pick money, you're probably a dick. And I thought, well, that's what my mother taught me. Hmm. <laughs> so maybe I need to change that belief. So I worked on it. <laughs> I worked on changing it to something else. You know, I, mean, I couldn't change it entirely, but I could change it. I could make it somewhat more positive. You know, like, well, probably being able to manifest the money you need to do what you want to do is more spiritually advanced than not being able to. I don't know. I mean, eating is important. Right. But I mean, I just, I just, uh, I, had, I guess I had a very negative uh, view or maybe some fear about what would happen to the state of my soul if I had any, right? And so, uh, so I changed this belief and uh, two weeks later, my entire career turned around. So I must've been in my own way the whole time. Cool. Uh, and all of a sudden, so many people were willing to help me. Uh, I got my record, the, the one that's going to come out, Apotheosis, recorded mm. entirely for free. Uh, I had every musician in town who I, I did, I, a lot of them I didn't even know, wanted to play on it for free. Uh, just wanted to be involved, loved me, loved my work. Mm. I, I was just, I was not aware. I was just, you know, writing this column for the newspaper and, you know, being home and reading books, you know, and so uh, so I started to uh, to make this record, and uh, and a strange thing happened to me, which is uh, if you're familiar with my work, I mean I know that you are, you're not mm. so much, but uh, I write very good songs, and they're quite durable. You tend to not get tired of them. They're they're, they're intended for repeated listening over periods of decades. That's oh how yeah, I mean I I've been the the glass eye records dead dog's eyeball another well another day in the sun was in constant rotation until it got eaten by my car but like right i mean it's like it was, yeah like it holds up it's it's really and i yeah like i i have a lot of record dealer friends because i buy and sell records and somehow like i i've been especially leading up to this i was super excited about doing this interview and i was like we got Kathy McCarty on the show, and then they've just been, I've just been spamming them for like the last yeah. two weeks, you know? Well, well, so, 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 I, so I do have this one uh, thing that's a little bit unusual, which is my music is durable. Hmm. But it's not, a lot of times that worked against the concept of accessibility. Like people would hear hmm. Glass Eye, uh, especially, uh, uh, and they would be like, I don't get it. You know, it would take a while. You could listen to it like, you know, five times mm. more than like, oh, I kind of like this. And then they're like, oh, that's my favorite record. And I'll listen to it the rest of my life. Mm. You know? But it was a big hump at the beginning, sort of. And, uh, and suddenly I started writing things uh, after this change in my, uh, in my mind uh, that were accessible and durable, both, mm. which was a really big breakthrough. And it's not just my opinion. <laughs> mm. uh, like I, uh, I, I wrote this one song and I, and I went to Brian and I said, I think I wrote a hit song. And he said, well, play it for me. And I played it for him and he went, I don't want to produce it. He said, that's a hit song. I don't know what to do with a hit song. I don't know what to do with a hit song, you know? So, so I, uh, that's been, you know, my, my experience is people, people hear these songs, me playing them. They're like, did you write that? <laughs> Well, and it's funny you say that because when I picked up the Christine EP years and years and years ago, it was like immediate. I, I thought like this is it's oh, catchy. Really? There, yeah, I was like, 
Well, you're- I had a radio show on the local radio uh, college radio station. That's probably how that tape got so worn down because I was playing it on this radio yeah. show all the time. Well, um, you're probably a more erudite listener, you know, than some people. And then also the song, Christine, is, is somewhat more accessible than some other songs, even though it's a hmm. very strange song. It's, it's probably the most popular, you know, most famous glass, excuse me, glass eye song. But mm. if you look at it, it's it's four verses, no choruses, no middle eight. I mean, it's 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 weird. Oh yeah, but there's a build up, like there's there's a yeah, like Brian, a, Brian, Brian crescendo. Like, yeah, Brian put dynamics into it. But when I took it to the band, it was just like four verses. And here it is. But I, mean, I knew I, it was a good song. I knew I knew that it was a, a it was a breakthrough, you know, at the time. But I mean, yeah, I, I think when I sent it to, uh, when I sent it to Ron a few weeks ago, he. I, I think he used the word like operatic almost. And like, it has that kind of towards the end, it has that sort of like, it builds up this emotional t- intensity. Mm-hmm. I just remember I was like immediately struck by it. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, I mean, I guess I was young and impressionable, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean uh, there, there have always been a certain number of people who like liked us right away. I mean, mm. like liked, liked our stuff right away, but as far as the general populace and then people at record labels, they'd just be like, I don't know how to market this. What is it? <laughs> and it's like we always felt like we were doing slightly, in, slightly innovative pop music was what all we were going for, really. <laughs> but uh, but we got labeled avant garde. It's an avant garde, you know. And uh, so right, but it, it's like it's. I don't know. I feel like there there are hooks, you know. There's like oh, yeah. you're you're not like trying to alienate the audience, you know. Like you we're just trying to do our thing, you know. Right. Like, and we had an interesting thing in Glass Eye where we all came from very different musical backgrounds because we the the basics of, basis of the band was friendship, not not thinking alike about music. And uh, Brian was a big jazz guy, very 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 erudite and uh, uh, extraordinarily good. Uh, and uh, and uh, Stella was a classical music person, and mm. Scott liked Kiss. And, uh, <laughs> and I, uh, as you asked me earlier, like what do I sing in the shower? Uh, my uh, musical life up until the age of like meeting Brian, I guess was 17 years old, was folk music, uh, mm. I, I, especially traditional Irish folk music. My, huh. my name is Kathleen Ann McCarty, after all, and uh, I'm from the <laughs> Irish family, and uh, that's what we listened to, mm. music that was hundreds of years old. Uh, that's probably one reason why I tend to write toward durability is because it, those are the songs, that's how good I think a song needs to be. So it'll last <laughs> hundreds of years. So right. that's what I was going for, you know? And so we had these uh, very distinct, different angles we were coming at it with, and then we had a band together, and so it, our, mu- our music was uh, somewhat more original, I think, because of that. Huh. And, and so I guess to backtrack a little bit to kind of complete the story, um, how did uh, uh, Every Woman's Fantasy come together? Well, when Glass Eye broke up, we had a whole album's worth of material, some of my best stuff. Hmm. And uh, Brian said he wanted to put it out anyway. And so I waited a decade for that to happen. It didn't happen. And finally, after 10 years, I said, can I have my songs back and put them on my solo record? And he said, yes. So a bunch of the songs on Another Day in the Sun are actually Glass Eye songs. Uh, the Basement is a Glass Eye song. Another Day in the Sun itself is a Glass Eye song. Oh, Brother is a Glass Eye song. One Chord is a Glass Eye song, off the top of my head. Hmm. Uh, and so, uh, and then I wrote the other ones, you know, in the meantime. And, uh, and so I pulled my songs and uh, I think he felt orphaned as far as his songs. <laughs> And the songs I didn't pull, and he wanted to put out another woman's fantasy. So that came out around the same time that Another Day in the Sun came out. He just went ahead and finished it. And uh, my favorite song on that record is Ruin. Uh, mm. Oh yeah, yeah, that's like that's an incredible recording. Yeah, I that, that one was on repeat. I think like like usually when I listen to a record, I'll listen to it all the way through, and there's going to be one or two songs, and I just got them. You know, if I got the house to myself and it's not going to drive everybody crazy, I'm just listening to them on loop. I do that too. I like <laughs> song over yeah, and, over and, over. and and I probably heard Ruin like a few hundred times. Yeah, it's a really good song. That's one of the songs that sometimes sometimes Glass I would uh, jam and we'd make up music that was music that we had made up as a group, mm. and then one of us would say, "All right, words for it." And that was that was how that came about. That was a Glass I jam, and I said, "I got something for this," and I and I wrote Ruin, and I and uh, I think Brian wrote a boring story the same way, and. Mm. Uh, Anyway, uh, so that came out later, and uh, and it has some good songs on it, and I mean that's why that one came out was, was, mm. was to get the rest of the get the rest of the archival glass eye stuff out there, and um, and uh, uh, anyway, anyway now I'm making this new record uh, mm, called, yeah. 
called a uh, uh, apotheosis and uh and it's all recorded uh i just need to mix it and i've mixed a couple of tracks but uh brian a, a piece of uh, important equipment in his studio broke and he's waiting to get it fixed and it's been eight months eight months i've been waiting for this to get fixed so we can finish <laughs> finish mixing i mean i i got a lot of old electronics lying around if you know what it is i might have one sitting in my garage it's a two-track machine okay I think I, I at least know somebody who has a two-track machine. I'll ask around. It's close to being fixed. I mean, hopefully, hmm. and then we'll get this wrapped up. But then also the COVID shutdown happened. For a long time, yeah. it didn't want me or anyone to come over because uh, he had a heart surgery uh, a couple of years ago now. And, uh, you know, he's been careful. And uh, and I myself um, actually had the COVID uh, before hmm. it was a thing because I tend to catch everything immediately. And uh, I got, I had, I was really sick in February of 2019 before the shutdown. I was sick for 23 days and I had, double, I had double low bar viral pneumonia. And, uh, and I never thought about going to the hospital. I just thought I had a really bad flu and uh, eventually got over it. And, uh, and I actually had COVID. And so I'm less scared about getting it than some people because I already got it. And uh, mm. I mean, I'm vaccinated and everything and, uh, you know, trying not to get Delta and stuff, but uh, but I, but Brian has been much more careful than I have been. In another case where you were ahead of your time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, nobody worried. I felt like I didn't get any sympathy. Nobody worried about me. They're like, oh, I got me sick again, you know. But anyway, uh, so anyway, so the, the COVID shutdown has played into this, and it's also kind of given me this uh, some degree of, of relaxation about it because I'm kind of like, well, it's not like you can tour now. Like mm. if, it, if, if apotheosis was out and ready to go, you, it's not like you could tour because nothing's open. Mm. No one's going out, so just hold your horses and don't be a pain, you know, just wait for, just do what you can, you know. And that brings me to another thing uh, that, uh, you know, I told you I was but writing for the newspaper. Hmm. So, uh, I'd always intended to become famous and then write my autobiography. Uh, hmm. And I've always figured I'd do this in my 50s when my life was over. And uh, <laughs> I in my 50s and I thought, uh, well, you know, you didn't get famous, but you still want to write a book and i was like what well, yeah, i do so i signed up for some uh memoir writing classes to make sure i knew what i was doing and they were very helpful and uh i started uh turning stuff into my professor and and uh i was really good at it right away because i'm a good writer and uh she uh pulled me aside and said you know this is publishable and i was like gosh thanks you know <laughs> to publish it at some point and then i uh shared some of this with a friend of mine and uh she said she flipped out and she was like you need to write this book it's so good. You need, to, you need to fucking write it. And I said, well, I always wanted to. I mean, don't you have to do this my arm that, that hard. It's the like COVID shut down. I, I, I can't go in the studio and can't earn any money. I mean, I'm making these little bootlegs and stuff, but I, I, I have time to write a book. And so I wrote a book and it's, it's just about done now. And uh, this is part of my, my plan to uh, become <laughs> a household name in my 60s is that mm. my book will come out and it will make people interested in my music and, uh, and then they will buy it. That's my plan. Mm. And so uh, that's a thing that, that's another thing to talk about. My book at, at the mm. moment, I mean, I'll, I'll call it whatever they want me to call it because I know the authors don't have all that much power over the title of their book and things like that. Mm. But it, its working title is A Hunk of Junk. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's really quite humorous and fun to read. And, uh, and, and the, 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 uh, everyone was like, you have to write your whole uh, life story in one volume. And I said, can't be done, can't be done. Mm. Uh, I said, I know that I need to get some famous people in here. So I, I'm gonna bring it up to the point I meet Daniel. Uh, so it's from birth to Daniel. Mm. And the second volume is gonna be Glass Eye in the Years of Touring. And uh, and the third volume will be, you know, whatever the rest of my life is. Um, but uh, I'm uh, very hopeful about it. Uh, and we'll see what happens, you know. I wonder if anybody said that to Marcel Proust, right? Like, you got to get this in 200 yeah. pages, yeah, right? 200 pages, right. Uh, and, like, everyone just thought I was like, crazy that I'm just, you know, I was planning to have three volumes. But I'm like, yeah, I got three volumes in. Uh, and I think that after people read the first one, they'll want to read the second one, you know. because I mean, it's how many stories you got, right? It's, exactly. it's not yet. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so do you want me to play something for you? Uh, I yeah, we that would be love it. Yeah. Okay. I I think I probably should have uh, broken this down, broken this apart, and, and played things at appropriate times. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe I can talk a little bit in between the songs or something. Yeah. Oh, I've got something else to. I have one other thing to talk about that I haven't. Um, I'll talk about that after I do this. I'm right. going to play uh, the song that I'm most famous for, "Living Life" by Daniel Johnston. As my first number, it usually is. <laughs> Somebody should care, although tomorrow 
you don't look that good Well, it just goes to show Though people say we're an unlikely couple I'm seeing double of you never cleaning my laptop again that was <laughs> <laughs> i hope you don't mind that i was closing my eyes and moving my head along to it so. oh you get, i remember i can't really see that well oh, oh okay. yeah right. yeah that's that's what he does most of the moment. time when i'm talking you know yeah. uh you might notice that i played that fairly well in guitar that's because i've been having some gigs lately uh and uh and uh that's been good for me because i i, I tend to not practice the guitar as much as i ought to uh, usually when I pick it up, I'll practice for a little while and I'll just start writing because I get bored of playing something I already wrote. And, and, I'll, and I'll, but, I ha but I had this uh, show I was doing for a while and uh, I was talking to a friend of mine over the text and, mm -hmm. uh, and I had sent maybe a hundred texts and, uh, and I was uh, chided, uh, don't you ever shut up? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, I don't really, I, I do have the gift of the gab. <laughs> and I said, you know, I could probably do a one woman show on Broadway, unscripted for six months and never repeat myself once. And it'd be, it'd be, interesting. It'd be interesting too. And so it's kind of this joke that I had said this and, uh, and I, I repeated that to my husband and he said, no, you really should do that. You really should do a one woman show on Broadway. And I said, well, no one's going to hire me to do a one woman show on Broadway. No one has ever heard of me. And he was like, no, you're famous. And I was like, yeah, here, you know, <laughs> famous, you know, but I didn't put the idea in my head. And I thought, well, you know, maybe after my best selling book and hit record come out, people have heard of, will have heard of me. Maybe I'll do that at some point in the future. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll maybe I, I'll approach someone on Broadway and say, I'd like to do a one woman show. <laughs> and then I got offered a residency because a, a very popular band, um, decided not to play during the Delta break uh, because uh, they felt uh, that uh, they just didn't want to risk it. Mm. And so their residency came open and they asked me if I wanted it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I want it. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so I had this residency for a brief period of time. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, uh, I was going to do a one woman show mm. in five years, but why don't I start doing it now? Because I, I've got to do something interesting, something dif different and interesting to get people out who you feel comfortable going out during the outbreak. Uh, because I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. You bring anybody in or not, you know? And mm. uh, a lot of the people that are my age who are my fans don't go out very much. And uh, a lot of younger people haven't heard of me. And, and, uh, and I thought, well, if I make it really interesting, mm. maybe people will see it and they'll bring their friends the following week. You know, mm. they'll be like, you gotta see this, you know? And so I wrote it, I wrote my one woman show and I did it for several weeks. Uh, and uh, it was good, and I was good at it. I was right. I am good at it. And even the very first time I did it, the people that were there were like, "That was seamless." And I was like, "Really?" Because I was winging it the whole time. 
time. Uh, so uh, apparently, I am, apparently I am good at it. And that's uh, one reason I'm playing guitar slightly better than usual is because I've been playing. And uh, I mean, that's that's an after look forward to the Kathy McCarty one woman show on Broadway. Huh? After speaking to you on 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 Zoom for this this podcast, I I completely I can see it in my head. Oh, yeah. like it's really it's yeah like I yeah the, the no skepticism whatsoever. I'm sure this was probably like great. Yeah, it was, yeah, so it was you... very enjoyable, and the people that saw it you know, super loved it. And uh, and so I mean, maybe I can I'll be able to do it again. Obviously, I need to do it more before I actually. Go on Broadway, but of course I've got to get my book published. It's the next job, mm, That's right. one right now, uh, and finishing finishing apotheosis. And I've got to make a bunch of videos, which is fun because I'm good at it. Mm. Uh, I have a natural talent, and uh, all the videos that I ever made, like if you, if you were watching on YouTube, the rocket ship video, mm. like, that was me. Oh, you made that? I made that all myself. Yeah, I mean oh, that was great. I, I wrote it and I, I scripted it out and. And uh, I had some uh, wonderful people helping me because I didn't have a camera. So I, I, I asked around, does anyone have a Super 8 camera? And uh, Clark Walker uh, from Detour said I, he had one and he filled that for me. And then this uh, other gentleman named Hyde Fontenot, a local video producer, uh, edited it for me because at that time you needed to have a, a really big equipment, a big editing bay, not like now with a computer. Now I can shoot all the videos I want on my iPhone and do them mm. on my computer. And so I've been back, I've been working on that. <laughs> I've got, I mean, I still have to make them, but uh, <laughs> But, it's, but the technological aspect of it is kind of covered now, whereas that used to be very, very big hurdle, you know, uh, just to even get things shot mm -hmm. or edited. And um, anyway, uh, I was going to play another couple of songs while I was here. Uh, uh, I was going to play a song off Apotheosis. Uh, this is a song off my newer record, and uh, it has an interesting backstory, uh, which I'll tell you. Uh, it's in my memoir. But um, uh, when I was in... Uh, 24 years old, I fell in love for the first time. And uh, it was with a, a gentleman named John D. Graham, if you if you know of his work, uh, he's a local mm -hmm. musician here. And uh, and uh, it was a very uh, intense thing. And uh, when we first got together, uh, we he did not know that I was a great songwriter and I didn't know he was one. He was famous as a guitarist at the time and, and didn't sing. So I didn't know that all these bands that he was in, that he wrote songs. Uh, and so uh, he played me this music. And I said, that's, the music is so great. Uh, that's so beautiful. And he said, well, you can have it. And I said, what? And he said, you can have it. I, I can't think of any words for it. Said, you can have the music. You just, you can write the words for it. And I was like, oh my God, I, I better, I better write the words for it right, right away. Cause he's going to take it back. He's going to think of something. He's going to take it back. And uh, so I learned the music, uh, how to play it. And, uh, and then I tried every single set of lyrics I wrote for the next 35 years out with this music and none of them went. Uh, and he forgot all about it. But I, I have forgotten how to play many of my own songs. I have no the fucking idea what I'm doing on guitar and some of those last I songs. I'm like, what am I doing? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> but I always remembered this music because I kept trying out all these lyrics for it. And I finally, uh, when I was making this record, I finally wrote words for it. And I thought that it was a, a very personal song that nobody would really like, but it's kind of emerged as a lot of people's favorite song. And it might end up being the first song on the record which I didn't think was going to be the case, uh, but that's what's being considered now. And, uh, and it's a song called Minuteman, and it's about uh, me driving my car when I was a teenager. <laughs> All right. And the music is by John D. Graham. I always want to be sure to say that so people will know that I didn't write it. <laughs> Oh, 
You know, I wow. wouldn't have known if if um, if we hadn't been here sitting with you and you performed both songs just listening to it. I wouldn't have guessed that it was the same person. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I like I, mean, I like that song a lot. And when I finished it, I was like, yeah, it's kind of a sleeper hit. You know, I mean, I really like when I in my car listening. I got real happy mm. when it comes on and everything. Yeah. And then I was talking to a bunch of people about uh, I, I had uh, one of the songs that I sent you. Uh, the song called Limited is mm. the one that um, that I. Uh, thought should be the opening number. And it's a song that I wrote. Uh, uh, this Today is the anniversary of Daniel's death. And I wrote it for him mm -hmm. after he died. Mm -hmm. And the lyric of the song is all, uh, it's, it, he didn't write the lyrics, but the lyric is taken from things that he actually said to me when I met him. And uh, so it's a tribute to him, you know, of sorts. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you, I guess you, you should play that, I think. Uh, I'll, I'm done doing the live stuff, and uh, you can and play that number when you do some more music, but uh, yeah, or, or something. But I always thought that would be the opening number, and um, and then when I was uh, uh, asking other people uh, mm -hmm. who'd heard who heard the roughs, uh, what they were thinking about uh, the first number, and uh, everyone put, picked Minute Man. <laughs> I was kind of surprised. <laughs> I was like, really? I mean, I kind of thought saw that as the last song on the first side or something, you know, not that people care that much about, you know, video, I mean, the vinyl sequencing, but I still think that way, you know. Hmm. Old. I mean, I, I don't know what the other songs on the record are, but that, I mean, if, if you're trying to like draw people in like immediately, they, yeah. that, that was like, oh, you know, like that was a, uh, and I mean, you, your voice sounds really good. I know I'm a better singer now, which is nice. It, yeah, like I finally figured it out. Uh, <laughs> it, it was interesting because I, I, I when I, I was in a, a rock opera a few years ago, maybe uh, ten years ago, uh, of all Daniel Johnson songs, and they asked me to play the lead female in it. And I, I this was over email, and I said, "Have you seen me?" <laughs> and I said, uh, "You know, I'm, I'm I'm rather old. I don't think I could." pull off playing a teenager and uh and also i'm quite heavy because i had a, a health problem at the time that was making me really heavy and uh i mean i uh, i'd love to be in it but i mean seriously meet me first because i think i don't want to see the look of a gassed horror on your face when you actually see me if you're just only looking at pictures from me when i was younger and uh and they met me and they were like yeah you, you're not going to pull off teenager and i said i didn't think so and they said well we wrote a we wrote a uh a part just for you and then so i was i was, I was part of the uh of the show and I sang the song Hey Joe off of Dead Dog's Eyeball mm -hmm. uh, and the personification of an angel, which I thought was nice. And uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, the point of this whole story is one of the other guys that was in this was a vocal coach. And he said, I'll be happy to teach you because you're singing and I can see you're doing a bunch of shit wrong. And I said, well, I taught myself to sing over punk rock music with no amps. And so I'm sure I have all kinds of terrible <laughs> habits, you know? And then uh, finally, I, when I when I started to uh, Think about doing this again. I thought, you know what, you know, it might be smart to call that guy up and take some lessons. And so I did, and, I, and he taught me some things that I didn't know, but I didn't really get the total hang of it, uh, of really singing properly entirely. But it was better. And uh, then I 
recently, I mean, super recently, really, uh, I went to go support another local woman, a woman named Bonnie Whitmore, who I think is a really talented songwriter. And, I, and uh, I've been kind of making more of a point of going out and paying cover because no one's going out and I'm not afraid mm. I'm going out and I'm going to ask it anything, but I mean, I'm willing to go out. I'm not that scared. And so, uh, so I went to her show and it was really good. And, uh, and she had her record for sale. And I thought, well, if I'm really being supported, I should, I should buy it. And my inner guidance, which is something that I've learned to listen to now, uh, it's my new thing, just listening to the old inner guidance. My inner guidance said, whether you get famous or not depends on whether you buy this woman's record or not. And I was like, wow, that's pretty heavy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an ultimatum right there. Yeah. And I was kind of like, I mean, I assumed it was some kind of like uh, what goes around comes around. So if you're willing to support mm-hmm. other people, they'll be willing to support you. I mean, some kind of, you know, energy thing. I don't know. And, but I was like, well, I got 20 bucks, you know, of my husband's money. In the pocket now. <laughs> and so, and so I, uh, I, I bought a record and then I, I knew that there was this one song that I'd like to sing for do live that I thought I said oh I like that song I'll you know put that one on and uh and I put it on I was like oh yeah I, I really like this song and I was singing along with it and then it just clicked and all of a sudden I was doing all the things singing along with her song that my vocal coach tried to teach me and I was like oh my fucking god I'm doing it and then for a long time I could only do it when I was singing that song when I was singing an older song I, w- I would go mm. back to muscle memory to the old way but I've gotten to the point now uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm using the correct singing uh, technique most of the time, you know, so that's a big breakthrough. Mm-hmm. And it certainly made the whole inner guidance thing make more sense, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> because I'm certainly a lot more likely to get famous if I'm singing properly than if I'm getting <laughs> my voice out after three songs and hardly able to make any noise, which was what used to happen. So uh, that's, that's, that's a thing. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, do you want me to play another song or not? I mean, I'm happy to, I don't know how long this is. I, going. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I mean, if if you want to play another song, I'm I'm not gonna stop you. Like it was uh, the last two were great. Yeah, I want to hear the rest. I, of the I mean, I, I also I, I, I you know I, I don't want to be like oh well, you know what you know, I, pushy I, or anything. Uh, uh, you guys are in New England, right? Uh, I'm in upstate New York, and Ron is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I'm like out near uh, Saratoga Springs. I'm like 15 minutes from the horse track. Mm, yeah, it's nice, nice up there. Yeah, yeah. I always like playing around there because it's really nice. I mean, no matter what time of year, it's really nice. Uh, uh, let me think. Um, I kind of feel like playing this odd song off of Apotheosis. Uh, okay. And my inner guidance told me to have it ready for today. Uh, so mm, maybe that's right. what I should play. I'm going to talk a little bit about it first. Um, I was watching uh, The Civil War by Ken Burns. Mm. And uh, I'm sure you've seen it. I came to this one scene where they're talking about this guy and this guy had fought on the side of the Confederacy for the entire war from Fort Sumter to Appomattox. He was in every battle, but was never killed. And uh, when he was old, he wrote his memoirs and, uh, and he said in it that his idea of heaven would be to get to fight it again, which really struck me because that is not most people's review of that event. Um, most people give it no stars, maybe one star, very few five-star reviews of the Civil War. Right, yeah, like the, mostly the dying of dysentery, you know. I mean, it was like you know, horrible, horrible conflicts that you know, just, uh, rather bad. And and, uh, <laughs> and it really struck me that uh, that uh, that he felt that way about it. And then he said something that I thought really resonated with me. He said, um, uh, "Did it not seem real?" And it implying that like everything we experience here on Earth is an illusion. It seems real, mm. but it's not. And, uh, and I, I kind of uh, used the, uh, the words of his memoir uh, to talk about the Civil War, obviously, but also about just the whole incarnation experience, you know. And so this song is called, Did It, Did it Not Seem Real? Right. All right. And it's not one of the hits, not, it's not one of the uh, super accessible hits on the record, <laughs> but uh, it's a really solid piece of work. And it's, it's a good song, right? Forgetting the words. <laughs> Hold on. It may be given to us after this life to meet again in the old quarters play at chess and drafts to get 
get up soon to answer morning roll call and all will say did it not seem real was it not as in the old days to fall in at the tap of the drum for drill and dress parade and again to hastily done to hastily done Three for three. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was great. Wow. Yeah. Good one. Uh, uh, really, uh, I did something on this record that was a little bit different than, uh, than, some, than what I've done in the past, which is I usually make, write all my own songs. Uh, mm. I, I mean, I covered all Daniel's songs on that one record, but I don't, I don't tend to cover other people's songs. But after I had written about six songs on this record, I realized that it was a hit record. And I thought, mm. I want to cut my friends in on some of this money, uh, <laughs> what I think deserves some money. Uh, and uh, Daniel was dead already, so I mean, I did cover one of his songs because I had been intending to anyway. Uh, but um, but I thought about another songwriter that I really like locally is a, a, a man named Steve Collier, who was the uh, major songwriter for a, a band called Doctor's Mob. Oh yeah, I, I have the cool. Doctor's Mob CD. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah. He's an incredible writer and uh and and he's still doing it he still has a band and uh you know, he's got a family in a band but but uh you know i really th think he's someone that people should should know is so good mm. and uh and so i covered a song of his uh called green and it's one of the hits on the record and uh covered freedy's song california mm. thing and uh and then a daniel song i think that might be i think that might be it on the covers but uh but i but that, so it's not all me i mean i i, I was trying to uh, get some other people in and then i co-wrote that song with john d and i co-wrote a song with rich brotherton uh another uh, person that I admire greatly, who was a friend of mine here. And, uh, and then I also co-wrote a song. <laughs> this is interesting, since I asked you to play Limited. Uh, I was sitting around on Facebook, I mean, not doing much of anything. And uh, I got a message from a guy and he said, hi, I, you don't know who I am. You've met me several times, but I'm sure you don't remember me. Uh, uh, but anyway, I, uh, I have stage four cancer and it's, it's returned for the second time. And so I'm looking at my bucket list very seriously. <laughs> and he said, well, on my list is I'd like to jam with Caddy McCarty. And I was hmm. like, when? I mean, when? When, when, when would you like to get together? <laughs> <laughs> Cancer, he's gonna die. That's, yeah, that's- and, uh, uh, and so I, you know, I said, how about Monday? I'll come over Monday. 
you know? And I went over to meet him and, uh, and we jammed and, uh, you know, uh, he asked me to play some songs. And I was like, oh, I don't know how to play that. And I would try to remember. And I would go kind of like this, and, you know, we were just having a good time. And, uh, and then he said, you know, I, I wrote this music several years ago, but I've always heard it being sung in your voice. And I said, well, play it for me. I'm, I'm totally into co-writing at the moment. I mean, I used to be resisted, but I'm, I'm, I've co-written two songs for this record already. Mm. And uh, he played it for me and I was like, I can totally use that. And, uh, and so I did. And, uh, and that's the song where I used uh, the uh, sentiments expressed by Daniel Johnston at um, uh, the song called Limited. Anyway, so when you played that, that's-, that's Yeah, that's yeah. This is like, I am really excited for this record. It, yeah, yeah. It's real, well, I, I think of it as it's, it's my my aim is true. It's my breakthrough record uh, mm. because uh, it has like at least six really accessible hits on it, and then even the ones that I didn't think were hits like Minute Man, uh, people really like. And then it's got these songs that I can feel very positive about because I mean, mm. someone else wrote them, and I think they're so great. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the song is great. And uh, I mean, I've got my I pretty much could record the record after Apotheosis immediately. It's just that there's no point because I can't seem to get in the studio and I don't have any money. So. Uh, yeah. The deal. Well, you don't have any. You, you don't have any money yet. Right. Right. I, I don't have my money yet. Uh, oh, that's coming. And I know there is some stuff happening for me. Uh, 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 so Showtime used my version of Golly G on television the other day. Uh, oh. And, yeah. uh, awesome. Linklater, I've heard Linklater may be using my version of Rocket Ship in uh, Apollo Ten and a Half because he is oh. a Daniel Johnson fan and is a big fan of Dead Dog's Eyeball. So, so that I haven't signed anything for that one yet, but that's some serious dough. And uh, yeah. it's happening. It's McCarty time, man. It's McCarty time. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, if you're McCarty if you're time. an industry insider listening to this, like license some songs. They're well, my my goal. I had this goal, uh, which was uh, to get a song in a movie. Uh, mm. I thought, and I was thinking about my new ones, not not so much the Dead Dog's Eyeball stuff, which is already happening, but. Uh, and then I had another thought a little while later, which is, why one? <laughs> why don't you get every single one of these songs in a movie? And I was like, okay, I'll get on it. So industry people, if you want to get on the McCarty train, get on it now because it's taken out the station. Take it yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, you only got how many months before the hit record comes out, right? Well, you know, uh, because of the vinyl thing, I'm not really sure. Uh, it, I, I used to think it would come out early next year, maybe in February of 22. Uh, now it's looking more like summer or fall. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't want to wait any longer than that. But it okay, just so you got a two month extension. Get on it. I know. <laughs> They're happening. Uh, and then, and then, you know, uh, the the thing is, when you have versions that are, are uh, mixed, I mean, they don't. Television movies don't have to wait for you to press anything. Mm. They just need the the digital file. So, mm. so they they can get on this a little bit earlier if they want mm -hmm. to and I, I was thinking that I really was thinking this and I may do it but I I uh I played a, a private party for Richard Linklater recently and uh, he, he listened to me play uh, I was glad mm -hmm. I thought that's good because I'm sure everyone's bugging him all the time about trying to get their music <laughs> in, his, in his movies so at least he you know, wanted to hear me and so if I send him some mixes maybe he'll listen to them and then I thought you know I should really just go like this hey I'm gonna get every song on this record in a movie or television show and I just thought I'd let you pick first because I like you <laughs> <laughs> do it do it that's that's out of swagger gratitude, right out of gratitude here. for using me already i mean I'm, we'll let you have first pick so he, and then he would listen to all of them because he'd have to pick <laughs> and then i think oh, yeah. oh that won't work and i'm like i don't know but one of my new approaches if it's not obvious is uh do everything you can think of like just don't do what they want don't pick a thing do out do everything do everything and 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 that that came to my uh uh assistance because um I, it also applies to songwriting I, I have this thing now where it's like if you start a song finish it I mean mm. maybe you throw it away after you finish it but finish it finish it mm. and so I'd written these lyrics and uh and I and I wrote them and I went to bed and then I went back and looked at them and they were like super super like I thought saccharin like really sweet and I mm. thought I, I don't think I can sing that publicly and uh and then I went back I read them again and I was like well, they're actually really good though um mm. and they were some of those ones that were like transcription from the universe where like you just write it down and you never change it you know it's like yeah. first time, and I was like well you know when things happen they're usually pretty good and uh I thought well I'll at least write some music for it and so I was tired it was late I just tossed something off and recorded it on my iPhone went to bed and then about two weeks later I thought well let's see if they go together and so I put the little recording on my phone you know and I, I was kind of trying to do the lyrics over it and I went oh my god this is the biggest hit I've ever written <laughs> <laughs> And I went and I played it for Brian and it was like, you wrote another hit song. I said, yeah, I thought it seems like that. <laughs> and so that's, that's another one of, one of the ones that's in the running for opening track because, uh, and I got used to the, you know, the scent, I mean, being able to say things in it. Uh, in it, I uh, compare myself to a cupcake. Uh, 
it's very feminine. <laughs> it's a little odd for me, uh, but uh, but you know, hey, I, I am a woman and I'm straight, so it's okay to be feminine. Okay. Uh, <laughs> people like cupcakes. People like cupcakes, exactly. And it's just like a really straightforward love song. And uh, mm. and, and and I know it's good. It's my and and, and I, once once I had a you know you, you take your mixes and you listen to them in the car. I had one that it wasn't on it, and I listened to the record and I was like, some something's missing. And I was like, oh, cupcake's not on here. And I was like, oh, I guess that's the heart of the record. I guess that's, I guess that's <laughs> the heart of the record. And without it, the record's not gonna be big. So it has to go on. Uh, anyway, okay. I know you're dying to hear it. You're just gonna have to wait until you have me on here. <laughs> Out. yeah no we're, like we're, for you. i mean if if you're willing to come on again we would love to have you on again this is a, a lot of fun well what i what i tell people when they ask me to their podcast or radio show or whatever i'm like i like to talk so i <laughs> but, and you know, you're gonna have to do some editing you know because i, I, I go on a bit uh, I can I can go for a long time, and I went, went and did this really quite popular podcast with Johnny Gowdy, and uh, and we talked for like two hours. And when I got done, he said, "Oh, so great having you on. You're so fun. Your story is good. Everything great." And I was like, "Well, I don't envy you having to cut that down to 30 minutes." He goes, "Oh, I'm going to put it on like it is." And I was like, "If I knew that, I wouldn't have talked so much." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, we, we kind of run hours, you know, this like like you usually. Uh, it, one of the running jokes on our show is is that the the episode runs longer than the movie we were talking about right. usually that makes we're, sense. we're well, both yeah. i mean i i got like terminal logaria um and then you know ron can talk ron can talk you know ron yeah. uh ron's more judicious with it than i am but <laughs> you know, one, one thing that i discovered is that uh a lot of musicians express themselves through music. Mm. And so a lot of them aren't really that good interviews. I mean, they're not that much fun to talk to because they don't like talking. They like playing music. Mm. And, and, uh, and I just happen to be this person who's essentially really a writer who plays music to mm. make people listen to my writing, you know? So, mm. so I'm much more of a, of a, of a speaker, you know, mm. um, and uh, so forth, you know? So uh, I, when I went out with Dead Duck's Eyeball Band and I started doing a lot of interviews on my own and and stuff the radio stuff and everything i mean it was really not, it was a charming thing for me to discover about myself because i didn't know you know mm. i didn't know that i was interesting compared to other people uh you know as far as mm. musicians who are playing in your town and things like that well you've got to come back on at least three more times okay. when apotheosis is released when you your book is published and uh when your uh, uh one woman broadway show is going on Definitely. Right. And, uh, and, and that's and, just three things, right? Well, there's three books, Ryan. Oh, well, right. I haven't written the other two yet, so that'll be great. <laughs> All right. but, but I'm starting the uh, I'm, I'm starting the actual process of getting published next week. Um, oh, excellent. Wait, well, I mean, starting the process. I'm not don't have a deal or anything, mm. but mm. I'm going to be meeting some agents, and uh, that'll mm. be. I'm hoping it will go well, uh, and uh, and that I will seem like, like an interesting person. I I, I was mm. uh, talking with a friend of mine, and I said. I've got to be careful not to be like a complete spaz when I go meet them, you know. And they and then I said, on the other hand, most writers are very mousy and quiet, and mm. and I'm trying to convince these people that I'm a rock star whose life is interesting to read about. So maybe I should just be myself. <laughs> maybe I should just whatever you're doing natural, right now, just you know? do that. Yeah. Yeah, just like be myself. <laughs> like... I don't have to show up in my kimono, but you know, mm. uh, I can just wear my whatever seems. To food, suit my mood, and and then I'll just, uh, you know, I mean, you, you got the rock star outfit, right? Like you. Well, you know, I was at a, I was outside the back of the Continental Club recently, and I I, I do some backup singing with John D's band, and uh, mm. and we had just uh, finished up, and uh, this guy came over and he was wearing a three piece suit, which in Texas is a commitment. And, mm. uh, <laughs> and we knew each other, and they started talking, and and this guy said. I think John D says something like nice outfit or something. And uh, and he said, Well, you know, my very first gig when I was 18 was with Etta James. And and I uh, she gave me some very good advice. She said, if you go into the club and people can't tell you're in the band, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> wow, he played with Etta James. That's crazy. Yeah. And he said she bought wow. she bought him his first suit. Uh, <laughs> where at the, at the show, they were doing a show in a casino. Uh, and uh, you know, the end of her career, and uh, and uh, and it was a wonderful experience for him. And he played with her for several years. And at the time, I think that she, he said, I think that she hired me because I had a blue mohawk, and she mm. thought that was fun on stage <laughs> with with sixty year old lady singer. You know? mm. I was like, well, she's pretty cool. 
I, I got to uh, step off camera for just a sec, but I can hear everybody. Okay. Well, I mean, we're, we're kind of essentially done. Okay. I feel like I should, I feel like I should, uh, you know, <laughs> zip it. Wrap right. up at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I've just got to say, I say, um, in, when we're talking to agents and then publishers, I, I imagine you'd be keen on doing a book tour. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Which is probably something I imagine most writers aren't. The writers that I know are not crazy about it, but I mean, I've, I've already been through that grist mill doing a uh, record store, uh, record store. Uh, what are they called? He's gone now. There's a name for it. Uh, you, you go to a record store to try and promote your record and uh, no one comes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. Uh, uh, and so, uh, I mean, I've done hundreds. I mean, I, I know the drill. You show up and you show up for the people that came. One person right. comes, you do it for them, you know? And, uh, and I, and I, and I'm, uh, I do believe uh, truly in my heart that my book will, will be a, a very big seller. Um, mm. so, uh, so that'll make it more fun. People will come. Right. <laughs> the, book tour, the book tour, it'll be, it'll be much more fun than, uh, than the, the in stores. That's what they're called. The in stores. In stores. Okay. I, I was, uh, thank you for having me. Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have a and about the book tour, uh, I do wholesaling stuff for like a lot of bookstores around here. Mm -hmm. I'll keep that in so mind. So if you need me to, you know, um, it, it, there's a few people who owe me favors, so I, I could probably get you into a few bookstores. Well, I'm intending to be, uh, my intention is for there to be a bidding war for my manuscript. And hmm. uh, get a very large advance, and then they're going to invest a shit ton of money in it. And it's going to be a major publisher. Now, not all plans work out, so. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the plan at the moment. So I might not need that help. But uh, at the same time, I could certainly use someone to help me, advise me about how to go about the things that I need to do uh, when when it does come out. So. Uh, yeah, and, uh, I mean. But... Yeah, I I. I uh... I know a few people in upstate. I, I, I sound like some kind of low-level mobster right now, but what I'm saying is like, I, yeah, like you, you need help or you need, you need me to contact some people about getting into some bookstores around here. I'm, I'm more than happy. Land to cap. Up. Do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> <What's up? laughs> Land cap or the cannoli. Uh, I, <laughs> I know where Jimmy Hoff is. I know where Jimmy Hoffa is. <laughs> hey, you want to hear an interesting story about Jimmy Hoffa? Yeah, I'm always down for a Jimmy Hoffa story. Okay, so uh, I, when I was young, I, I uh, uh, briefly lived in, uh, in New Mexico uh, mm. as an adult. I mean, like when I was like eight, uh, 19. And I couldn't uh, play music there because no one lives there and I had to come back to Austin. Uh, but, uh, but I was there for a while and I always wanted to buy a property there. So I used to go there on vacation. And it takes about a 12 hours to get there, which for Texas is not terribly long. And, uh, and I was like looking around for some property and I saw this abandoned property that I... Uh, that I was interested in. And I went to the house across the street from it to, to ask who owned it because I was looking to buy something. And uh, I, mean, I had like, you know, $10,000. I wasn't like I had a lot of money, but things were cheap then. And, uh, and the guy opened the door and he turned out to be this really cool guy named Dr. Kilb. And, uh, and he had used to be in the CIA. And he took me to this other property he had in the town of Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. And he mm -hmm. said, the one across the street from me is not for sale, but this one is if you're interested. And he took me to see this house. And he said, I don't know if it matters to you, but Jimmy Hoffa stayed here for almost eight months. <laughs> so <laughs> my story. Cool. And I was yeah. like, that's very interesting, Dr. Gill. Uh, I can't wait to tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like pretty wild. Pretty wild. And then he was on the level too. Uh, he was a, a very, very interesting character. And uh, I mean, his house was full of things like, you know, uh, that would back up all of his assertions. Uh, he'd published several books and he was a very interesting guy. I'm sure he's dead now. He was in the late eighties then, but uh, I ended up not buying anything because uh, it turned out. But uh, but uh, yeah, Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah, it's, it's funny how like some houses have like an energy mm -hmm. sort of around them, right? Like, like I, I was heavily involved with Occupy Wall Street to the point where I had an actual Russian agent trying to get to me. And I, I was smoking, I, before I knew this, I was smoking weed with the guy in uh -huh. this apartment and it was where, it was in Brooklyn and it was Towns Van Zandt's old apartment. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, oh. and I mean, I, I guess like if you got the backing of the Russian government, you, you can, you can get that kind of place in Brooklyn now, but 
<laughs> a lot of Russian people in Brooklyn, you know, right now. Yeah, well, no, he, he was he was from the U.S. He just like uh, like at the time. So like I knew a lot of weird people at that point. I, I mean, I, I've known a lot of weird people for most of my life. And and so this guy doesn't have a job and he tells me he's traveling back and forth to Russia trying to make a movie. And I'm just like, OK, that's every that, that's you know, that's that's barely registers. Right. Yeah. And and then it kind of came together like he was on my Facebook feed and he was just posting stuff about like we need to make peace with the North Korea. He was just like starting shit with everybody on my Facebook. So I just went point blank. I said, Charlie, are are you now or have you ever been employed by the Russian government? Because I knew a bunch of guys that were on RT back in the day. Uh -huh. And like a lot of them, I had very weird interactions with those people. Yeah. And uh, and he just like disappeared from the facebook feed and i was like wow i actually like wow. i played whack-a-mole and i got one wow but yeah and that's my towns van zant story that's a, that's a, <laughs> fair trade Just yeah. <laughs> trade okay i'm gonna i'm gonna sign off now all right thanks again for having me yeah thanks yeah, so much for coming on whatever you might want i mean if, I, if any career developments happen i will show up again yeah yeah any I'm any excuse to get you back on the show for sure <laughs> thank you so much all right yeah. have a great night bye bye thanks so much everything so this has been uh dan and this has been ron and uh our guest today uh if you didn't catch on by now it was uh kathy <laughs> of the of the band glass eye uh, she's done a lot of solo stuff she's coming out with a hit record so get hip before everybody else in your neighborhood does and uh and soon a book soon a book one a woman show. show and you know, and this sh there needs to be a film adaptation of the book she hasn't announced a run for president yet but she seemed like if we kept her on for another 15 minutes i think it would have come up yeah yeah um, <laughs> yeah 2024 yeah, no. is coming so but that was that was great. Like the the songs, like I didn't think she was gonna play anything. You know, that was like that was awesome. I am yeah yeah. I am like kind of. Uh, they tell you like never meet your idols, but I think that's bullshit. <laughs> um. Yeah, I guess we'll uh, we'll see you on the internet. All right. You know, unless care, you everyone. got any final words, Ron. No, other than this was a blast. And thank you for introducing me to her music. Um, <laughs> I think I never, you know, I, I was, uh, 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 I'm glad she wasn't offended in any way or something that I didn't know of her music before. But, you know, I, I sort of wanted to say that uh, <laughs> I'm not well read. I'm not well versed in music. The way I get in, the, the way I listen to new music, I listen to music all the time, but the way I listen to new music is if somebody says, hey, Ron, you should listen to this. And then I hear it for the first time, and then I play it endlessly for who knows how long <laughs> on loop. I mean, you're all we're talking about on loop, and yeah, I hope my neighbors can't hear my music. Um, that because, was the real reason I had to move to the middle of the woods. Right, so that you could play your music on loop and everything that you wanted to play. So no, no, I, I'm, I'm so glad. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was not only great to be introduced to your music, but also to, to Kathy. So thank you, Kathy, for coming on. It was a blast. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll see you. We'll see you on the internet. All right. Take care, everyone. Remember that our time together, however long, however brief. It could be 50 years together With a golden anniversary Or it could be only a matter of hours, days, or weeks Remember that our time together is limited by design Un
Rounded with a sleep. 